Hello everyone, this is Dr. Alex Vasquez with some follow-up information on mitochondrial nutrition and mitochondrial medicine for primary care conditions. And this is a brief follow-up to our recent event in Miami. I appreciate having had the opportunity to present this information. It always gives me a chance to refresh and renew my own appreciation and perception of the material each time I present it. And I think that helps to keep my information fresh and current and also helps me dive deeper into the details as you saw at least in in part especially when we were going through the mitochondrial specific uh, presentation information so you all have the notebooks by now if you want to get more notebooks you can certainly do that I'll show you how to do that at a discounted link here in just a minute and uh, in the meanwhile let's go through a few new slides that I just created I created these slides after the event because I had a new idea of how to present this information and also since the publication of the notebook uh, I have added a few more slides to the presentation material and I want to share those with you here. Uh, also we had a few copies of my rheumatology book available on site, uh, certainly not enough for everyone. If you want to get that book I'll provide you a discount link as well uh, so you can take advantage of that book. I think it's uh, a good value and it's about 628 pages, so obviously a lot of information. So uh, I'm writing to you today, or writing, writing and speaking to you today from Bogota, Colombia. Let's look at a few uh, ideas that I want to share with you after the event. What occurred to me later is that we could have really used a whole other day uh, to go through the, the protocols in more detail. By the time we meet again, which I would like to have a whole day just to go through mitochondrial protocols, Maybe we'll be able to coordinate that later this year. Uh, I went ahead and gave you the current versions of those protocols, but certainly within the next six months, things will change. I also want to share with you a few recent articles that were just published this month after the event, uh, one of which is on mitochondrial impairment in, in patients with a fatigue-related condition called Gulf War illness. And I've got a really nice new article on glyphosate that was just published this past month. Glyphosate is the herbicide most commonly used on genetically modified foods. Every once in a while I mispronounce that word, but that's because I am a phonetic speller, uh, despite having written about 17 books and 100 articles. So even though this is not uh, a CME presentation, I'll still adhere mostly to CME standards. So by now, as I already said, you've got this notebook. Uh, I made a few changes to the cover of the book uh, recently, but uh, that, won't, that doesn't change any of the internal material. Here's our Miami Beach location uh, where I went for a run uh, the day before and the day, the day of and the day after the, the conference. And I just wanted to throw in an interesting note about this. So a lot of times when I go for a run, uh, I run barefoot, which I enjoy. It's just more stimulating and I suppose in some ways more natural. But uh, on my second run, as I was going along the Miami waterfront, I saw this sign which says pesticide application keep off until dry. Well, that of course struck me uh, with concern for many reasons, one of which I was out there running barefoot. And the other thing is, I mean, what do you think happens to those pesticides when it rains and those pesticides have been applied right next to the water? obviously they go directly into the water and these are you know chemicals that are designed basically to kill things and I, I sometimes generalize pesticides and herbicides together but basically these are chemicals designed to kill life whether it's plants or insects but they're non-specific in their function they also kill other things and they impair mitochondrial function so you know I think we as a certainly as an educated mm, community need to become aware of this and and really not simply be aware of the problem but be active uh, in in addressing this problem uh, I think the overuse of pesticides and herbicides is really having a massively detrimental effect not only on human health but on the health of the overall ecosystem and planet if you look at the projections for uh, seafood harvest for example uh, this the oceans are expected to basically be dead by 2060 so uh, you can look at that and you can go to our Facebook page. Uh, it's facebook.com forward slash ICHNFM. And I've posted some information there about the fact that the oceans are basically dying. And I think at least part of that is not simply over harvesting, 
but it's also just the massive amount of chemicals that we continuously pour onto the earth and then of course those go into the uh, rain and water cycle into the oceans and rivers and lakes and ponds and it's it's not benign those pesticides and herbicides have a long half-life sometimes decades and uh, I think we're starting to see the consequences of our, our collective action there I'll have a few more comments on that later so I've added a few slides since the printing of the notebook I want to go through those uh, this is one of the slides Americans eat their weight in genetically engineered food uh, and I think any of us who are aware of this uh, would agree that this is really a scientific travesty that the American population in particular is being exposed to genetically modified foods and the associated toxins including the herbicides and none of these have been studied for their effect on human health long term now when you look at the when you look at the longer term studies that have been performed the data is horrendous well let me say it this way the data is good I mean the, the quality of the data is good but the implications are horrendous and we'll look at that I showed you and we talked briefly very briefly about this article that was published by Sarah Lini. this was the one of the first and only relatively longer term studies using genetically modified foods and associated toxins in animals most of the studies especially those done by industry are very short-term studies so what was impressive about this study is that it was more realistic and I've given you the details in your notebook so you can go through that and with any of these slides anytime you want to stop the video and look at the material read it word for word and take notes or make your own diagrams I think that's very important if you really want to learn the material you have to spend time with the material not simply have it wash over you at a rapid pace so as you all know by now because I presented on this uh, during our event this article by Seralini was recently withdrawn by the journal well specific criteria exist of course for the withdrawal of scientific publications and I've listed those here on the left hand side of the slide if the data is unreliable or basically worthless that's a cause for withdrawal if it's redundant like if the author submitted the same publication or the same research to two different journals for example that's called redundant publication plagiarism and unethical research those are the reasons for scientific retraction of publications the article by Seralini met none of those criteria however the journal hired a new quote associate editor and it was this was a brand new position at the journal so this wasn't a position that needed to be filled it was a position that was created and it was filled by a former employee of Monsanto uh, of the 13 articles that were published against the Seralini paper 11 of the authors had undisclosed financial relationships with Monsanto I strongly encourage you to take a look at a few of the articles that have been published on this topic one of which you can access online at the bioethics forum I've provided the link for you here and you know, I think we all have an obligation to be informed about what's going on and I think that what's going on is not uh, scientifically appropriate and I think it's not medically appropriate either if you look at this article from Scientific American weed whacking herbicide proves deadly to human cells I'll show you that data in just a moment and if you look at this other one glyphosate suppression of cytochrome p450 so basically this herbicide that's being sprayed across America uh, in pairs cytochrome p450 I'll show you something even more interesting in my opinion and specifically related to mitochondrial impairment in just a moment here's an article connecting glyphosate with gluten intolerance and celiac disease I'll read this quote from archives of toxicology 2012 since we found genotoxic effects after short exposure to concentrations that correspond to a 450 fold dilution of spraying used in agriculture our findings indicate that inhalation may cause DNA damage in exposed in individuals well one of the things that you have to know about glyphosate which again is this herbicide applied almost exclusively to genetically modified crops is that it is not destroyed by storage cooking or the digestive process so it's begun to accumulate in human tissues and I'll show you the data on that in just a moment here's another article you can take a look at online and now let's look at this brand new article this was just published in this current month uh, I've archived this uh, at the website and I've also opened a forum discussion on this topic you can see the hyperlinks above 
Detection of glyphosate residues in animals and humans. I'll just read the final two lines that I underlined. Glyphosate was significantly higher in urine of humans with conventional feeding, meaning people who are not eating organic food. Chronically ill humans showed significantly higher glyphosate residues in urine than the healthy population. Finally, glyphosate residues in both animals, sorry, in both humans and animals could haul the entire population toward numerous health hazards. Now, let's look at a few more details in the study. I think it's a very interesting study, and let's look at the, one of the final paragraphs in the article. Glyphosate has been described as a new environmental neurotoxin, and look at what I circled here. Exposure of animals to glyphosate may cause loss of mitochondrial transmembrane potential and result in oxidative stress to liver and brain. And then the final sentence connects it with Parkinson's disease. So notice how in our conversation about mitochondrial dysfunction and improving mitochondrial function, one of the things I mentioned is that we have to look for infections and environmental toxins. And this data is strongly supportive of what I presented to you just two weeks ago. Glyphosate may cause loss of mitochondrial transmembrane potential, and people are eating this every day. Obviously, I think that's a problem. Let's add another problem, which is BPA. Americans eat a lot of this because it's in plastics and it's on the internal lining of a lot of uh, tin cans, for example, so-called tin cans. So when foods are stored in cans, they're usually, usually the inside of the can is coated with a plastic uh, resin, so to speak, that contains BPA. It leaches into the food and then people eat it and it causes insulin resistance and other endocrine disturbances. Uh, I've recently performed another interview, in this case number three here, with Mike Ash. So I was interviewed previously on mitochondrial dysfunction. You have access to this. It was published in September of 2013. Another editorial was published in January of 2014. You have access to that as well. I've already posted it online. And just last week, I finished another interview with Mike Ash that's going to be published in a trade journal called Focus. So let me share a few new ideas with you, especially with regard to what I talk about as metabolic inflammation. So the first manifestation of inflammation, of course, is not inflammation in the classic sense of redness, swelling, pain, and heat, but rather it is loss of function. And we'll, I've got an interesting quote that I'll show you from a pathology textbook on the following slide. But the point that I'm emphasizing here is to say that the first manifestation of inflammation is impaired function, hence my term metabolic inflammation, and hence our focus on mitochondrial dysfunction. This is from Robin's Pathologic Basis of Disease, the 8th edition published in 2010. Although clinical features of inflammation were described in an Egyptian papyrus dated around 3000 BC, Celsus, a Roman writer of the first century AD, first listed the four cardinal signs of inflammation. These are rubor, tumor, calor, and dolor. Next sentence, these signs are typically more prominent in acute inflammation than in chronic inflammation, which of course you know I call sustained inflammation. A fifth clinical sign, loss of function, or functio laesa, was added by Virchow in the 19th century. So again, anytime we look at inflammatory conditions, we have to appreciate the component of metabolic impairment, which centers largely around mitochondrial impairment. So the first part of my presentation in Miami was an introduction to the overall protocol, and I went through this in a lot of detail. We reviewed it and kind of rephrased it in different ways because I wanted to make sure that you had the basic protocol. Once you have the basic protocol, then of course you can apply it clinically with a good amount of uh, dexterity and, and beneficial outcomes. The protocol specifically, and especially when we emphasize the mitochondrial component, is very well applied to migraine, fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue syndrome, hypertension, insulin resistance, obesity, and neurodegenerative conditions. These are what I call conditions of metabolic inflammation. So in the notes that you already have, you've got basically my protocol, which I categorize into three uh, components, so to speak, deletion, stimulation, and disinhibition, as you can see here. 
and I've given you basically the recipes for that for each of these components deletion, resuscitation, and disinhibition. Step number one, deletion. Basically I'll call this culling the herd or deleting the poorly functioning mitochondria. We went through that. You've got the data on it and I showed you how to achieve that. Step number two is support. Uh, a lot of speakers when they talk about mitochondrial dysfunction they emphasize basically nutritional supplementation perhaps for obvious reasons. I think we have to look at this more broadly beyond what I would consider to be very simplistic thinking around simply using nutritional supplementation. We have to ask, you know, other, other questions, which I have um, begun to do in some of the writings that you have access to now. So let's support the mitochondria and end what I call mitochondrial abuse with high carbohydrate diets. And I've given you the recipe for that. The overall you know, recipe book, the cookbook that you have uh, from my presentation contains at least 30, I think 31 uh, different interventions that you can use. And I've given you the, the doses for these things as well during the presentation. As far as disinhibition goes, the two components that I emphasize most strongly are removing toxins and also addressing chronic infections. So, you know, within the scope of whatever it was, six to seven hours of presentation, I can't go through every detail of everything, but I do provide a lot of information in the notebook that you have. So if you spend time with that notebook, you'll get the information. And also, if you want uh, additional information, you can look at the, the third edition of the Integrative Rheumatology textbook, for example, provides a lot more detail, especially with regard to treating these chronic infections and also some more information in there on detoxification. So overall, uh, the most important thing that I want to share with you in this presentation are the following uh, three tables that I've created. So when I talk about metabolic inflammation, I basically put this information into three different clusters. The first is migraine, chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia. A lot of times these conditions coexist, so that's why I cluster them together. You'll see that all of these conditions over the next uh, three tables that I'm going to share with you, all of these conditions, of course, center around mitochondrial impairment. So how can we treat these based on the protocol that I've provided? Uh, as you would expect, and as I stated, I consider the supplemented paleo mediterranean diet to be the foundation, and then we can add additional treatments on top of that. For migraine headaches, helicobacter pylori might be infection for some patients. Uh, nutritional immunomodulation may help them adapt to exposure to allergens. But the main thing that we see in migraine headaches is a primary genotropic defect in mitochondrial function, hence the emphasis on mitochondrial nutrition and other components of that protocol, which you already have. With chronic fatigue syndrome and fibromyalgia, the major problem there, the major causative problem, is gastrointestinal dysbiosis calling, causing what I have called microbial mitochondriopathy. So you'll notice that in both of these conditions, the fatigue-related conditions and migraine, both of those have a fundamental pathoetiologic uh, starting point or, or common theme, we might say, which is mitochondrial impairment. Migraine patients get there through primary genotropic defects. Chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia patients get there through a secondary uh, route, we might say, which is uh, microbial exposure. Look at this article that was just published March 27th, so this was just three days ago. Gulf War illness is caused basically by mitochondrial impairment. Now, I'll read the sentence and then I'll explain the sentence in some context. Researchers at UC San Diego School of Medicine have demonstrated for the first time that veterans of the Persian Gulf War who suffer from Gulf War illness have impaired function of mitochondria. Well, that's very good of them to do this research. It's a little bit egocentric for them to say that they were the first people to discover this because it had already been published, uh, including clinical trials published by Garth Nicholson. And I'll show you how to access some of his research in just a moment. But, you know, we are seeing good support for this whole concept. Mitochondrial impairment is very real and the clinical and social implications of it are, are quite massive. One of the slides that I wanted to review with you very briefly, just so you can kind of connect the dots. And again, what I do is I, one of the things I do is I try to present uh, recurrent themes and 
different ways of looking at the same information so that you can kind of get a multi-dimensional perspective on this information. So let's look at this slide, which, which I like quite a bit. Let's look at conditions associated with pain. So in this case, I'm going to use chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia, and interstitial cystitis as the prototypic conditions associated with pain. Let's look at central sensitization, inflammation. These are all seen, for example, in patients with uh, fibromyalgia. Let's look at leaky gut. All those patients have leaky gut, impaired detoxification, and mitochondrial dysfunction. So the question I ask here is, what is the one molecule that can account for each of these phenomena? I think this is very important because rather than seeing these conditions as disparate, and rather, rather than seeing these patients as desperate for some uh, cure which seems to elude the medical community, why don't we try to understand these things? And I think we can do that rather easily. So let's explain it just to prove how simple this is. Let's explain all of this based on one molecule, which is bacterial endotoxin or lipopolysaccharide or LPS. LPS, meaning microbial exposure, specifically to gram-negative bacteria, is the one molecule that can explain all of these things. And then we just see different patterns of expression in clinical practice. So I'll invite you to consider that. Let's look at cluster number two, which is hypertension, metabolic syndrome, insulin resistance. The dietary protocol that I provided for you, a low carbohydrate version of the supplemented five part um, Mediterranean, paleo Mediterranean diet, I think is the way to go here, of course. And mitochondrial impairment in patients with hypertension is very important. What we see is that mitochondrial reactive oxygen species quench or chelate, you could say, they bind to the vasodilating nitric oxide. So these patients are in a state of chronic vasoconstriction due to mitochondrial reactive oxygen species. The fastest and easiest and safest way to quench those mitochondrial free radicals is with CoQ10. If that were true, you would expect to see a lot of studies showing CoQ10's effectiveness in the treatment of hypertension, and of course those studies have already been published, and you have those summarized in your notes. These other components are of course very important, but I think we've got to look at the, the central axis of these conditions, which is mitochondrial impairment. With metabolic syndrome and insulin resistance, of course the diet is very important. These patients always have uh, mitochondrial impairment, most commonly due to xenobiotic exposure. So again, we see a central theme of mitochondrial impairment but patients have different routes to achieve that impairment or different ways of getting there, so to speak. In hypertension, several vicious cycles get initiated. So for example, it could be dietary insufficiency of uh, antioxidants, for example, or it could be smoking, which causes a lot of oxidative stress and then binds onto and neutralizes their nitric oxide and then puts them into a vicious cycle. For patients with insulin resistance, the dominant theme in the research is that xenobiotic exposure causes mitochondrial impairment, which then leads to insulin resistance and this whole disinsulinemia phenomenon. Let's look at the final cluster, which is number three, neurodegenerative conditions. I would encourage the use of the supplemented paleo-mediterranean diet, which I've already advocated and which you have the notes on. The strong data that's coming out these days is that Alzheimer's disease is a mitochondrial condition uh, triggered in large part by herpes simplex virus type 1 and the data on that I think is certainly accumulating. What's been shown lately in some animal studies of Alzheimer's disease pathophysiology is that antiviral treatments actually block the uh, development of Alzheimer's related pathology, at least in animal models. Now of course the real proof of that for us will be using antivirals in the treatment of patients who have Alzheimer's disease, especially those who are seropositive for herpes simplex type 1. About 50% of the worldwide population has herpes simplex type 1, 20% have herpes simplex type 2. The gold standard for epidemiologic surveying for that infection is Western blot, but you can also use ELISA. It's about 99 or 95% as accurate as the Western blot test, which is available exclusively through the virology clinic at University of Washington. Parkinson's disease, another 
mitochondrial related or mitochondriogenic we might say condition uh, again just like Park just like uh, diabetes uh, Parkinson's disease is also triggered by xenobiotic exposure in fact I'm, re I'm remembering right now an article that I wrote a letter on this was about this was about 2006 2007 and it was an, it was based on an article that had been published in the Lancet showing the connection between uh, diabetes and Parkinson's disease. Well, I wrote them a, a letter saying, well, the common theme here is xenobiotic exposure because xenobiotic exposure correlates with Parkinson's and xenobiotic exposure correlates with diabetes and therefore you would expect there to be some clinical overlap. And honestly, I don't, I don't think they published my article. Um, maybe I need to follow up on that, but I don't think it was published, even though I think I was right. Uh, you've got this notebook already. You can buy other copies from Amazon, uh, but if you do that, you have to pay full price. If you go to another distributor's website and use the discount code here, you can get it at half price. Uh, I had mentioned earlier some of the work of Garth Nicholson. I've posted several of his articles uh, on one of the websites that I help manage, and we also have videos there from the recent International Conference on Human Nutrition and Functional Medicine from September 2013 in Portland, Oregon. These, we had a whole day on mitochondrial impairment by Matt Hershey, Garth Nicholson, Michael Gonzalez, and myself. And if you want to access those videos and some of our articles, you can do that at the website uh, page listed above. I've also set up some forums to uh, continue the discussion. If you have any questions for me, uh, you can certainly log into the forum and post a question there and I'll try to address that. For those of you who are interested in uh, more copies of the Integrative Rheumatology 3rd Edition book that was just published in January of 2014, you can get that here from the distributor and you can use the discount code here to get half off. So thank you for letting me review a few updates and provide some more information. Look forward to seeing you next time and continuing our conversation on overall health, but in particular the rather fascinating topic of mitochondrial impairment.